welcome to another edition of RCE. Uh, we actually have a special show today, but before, you can find all of our old shows online at rce-cast.com. You can also follow me at Twitter, at Brock Palin, all one word. Uh, you'll also see me, you can send questions to me to have on future shows and things like that on there. Also, again, I have Jeff Squires, and Jeff, uh, you have something coming up recently, don't you? Yeah, but first got to make fun of you for not having your normal microphone. That's why you sound a little funny today. You're using your built-in laptop microphone. Shame! Shame I, on you, sir. No, but I'll just bust out my you know, professional amateur card and uh, get away <laughs> with it. true. <laughs> just two guys doing a podcast, ma'am. That's all there is to it. Just questions. Well, yeah, so today, uh, today's a little different. We're not doing normal HPC kinds of things, but really on the services that enable HPC kinds of things. It's stuff that probably... Uh, many of our listeners use or for you know connecting to their corporate networks or their home organization networks or things like that. Some people love this stuff. Some people hate this stuff, but I don't think anybody can say that it's not important. And I've, I've seen when uh, security is implemented poorly, it's really a pain. But when it's implemented well, it's uh, pretty seamless and you, you barely notice it. And so I think uh, today we're going to hear about uh, some ways to implement things well so that it becomes painless and actually uh secure yeah before we get into that though um i'm going to be out to the terra grid 11 conference i'll actually be out there early on saturday so if anybody is listening wants to meet up while you're in salt lake uh, you can just send me a tweet at brock Palin and, and i'll get a hold of you cool so let's jump in uh, to today today we're talking to two guys from duo security um and uh this this kind of touches on the, the administrative side of, of HPC, as, as I said, you know, services getting in, securely logging in, authenticating and things like that. Um, and uh, why don't we just go ahead and let you guys introduce yourselves. We have uh, Doug Song and John Oberheide. John, could you guys say hello? Hi, guys. Thank you for uh, having us on the show. Hey, guys. It's a great honor. So, uh, so I'm, I'm, this is Doug. I'm CEO of Duo Security, and um, my prior history was uh, I've done a bunch of other companies in the security space, um, everything from enterprise security to large-scale carrier-grade security for pretty much all the world's ISPs, about 80% of all the ISPs worldwide uh, using our, our systems from Arbor Networks. My name is John Oberhut. I'm the CTO of Duo Security. Uh, my background is in uh, security research, and uh, I've done my master's and PhD at the University of Michigan, focusing on a lot of topics such as uh, cloud security and mobile security that you know, we've really brought forward uh, into our product at Duo Security. Yeah, one thing John also doesn't like to spell out, but I will for him, is that he's also one of the world's experts on Linux kernel exploitation. So he <laughs> writes a lot of, finds and writes a lot of uh, exploits in, in you know, Linux kernels, um, but all, also now mobile devices, which are happen to be running Linux. Something that might be relevant to you guys with uh, HPC clusters, probably mostly based on, on Linux systems and having lots of you know, local users that might be uh, untrusted. Yeah, so that's something unique about a lot of HPC clusters. We're not like a single uh, single service that's facing it. We actually have to allow local user logins and access uh, and resource managers that run stuff as users on remote systems on their behalf. So what can we? What can you really do about supporting long-running batch jobs uh, when you have security updates coming out all the time? Yeah, that's a big issue, and um, it's, it's funny. You know, the first thing when whenever we we debug an incident or something like this, um, you know, is look at the uptime of the system because you know, guaranteed, uh, if it's been up for I don't know more than <laughs> a couple of weeks, <laughs> a couple of weeks, there's there's probably been a, a vulnerability that's been published that that you know would have led to a, a remote, well, not necessarily remote, but a, a root exploit if an attacker got access to the system. And um, I think, you know, John points out from some of his research that there really hasn't ever been a time that at least the Linux kernel has been um, vulnerable to some uh, exploit or other. Um, and so it is tough. It is tough to, to manage. And one of the things that, you know, we sort of, you know, uh, look to do with, with, with security in depth is make sure that um, even if one system gets compromised, that, um, you know, uh, an organization as a whole doesn't sort of suffer. And uh, there are ways to actually kind of contain things, um, and certainly, you know, some of the some of the batch queue systems and so forth that uh, you know some of these clusters have implemented over time, um, sort of been oriented around that. All right, partitioning um, you know, access to, to data and as well as uh, compute resources in a manner that uh, can isolate those kind of faults. 
but um, but it's, it's it's a tough problem, and and it's become a tough problem, particularly because um, the attacks are no longer just against those systems, but against the users, right, and admins of those systems, um, because it's easier. You know, almost everybody has either some kind of you know filtering firewall or again you know router switch configuration that that kind of protects um, those systems from from or firewall that rent from from remote access, um, but. Uh, you know, when attackers can simply mail uh, an email to somebody um, with a corrupted PDF that you know pops in, uh, you know, a remote shell or something on a user's box, um, or installs a uh, remote access trojan, um, there's very little you can do to kind of clean up after a, a user has been compromised. You know, um, it's pretty severely, and so um, you know, a lot of a lot of the focus and a lot of the the, the current rationale behind our current company Duo and, and a lot of what we're, we're you know, doing in terms of our research, is in figuring out you know security solutions that can deal with um, end users being compromised. So you mentioned their uh, exploited user account, or like they get a user's password or something like that, or some form of social engineering where they figure out a user's password. Mm -hmm. How common is it actually to see uh, a completely drive-by like if they have your IP address and they can actually just get into your system? Is that very common anymore? So there's definitely a lot of uh, brute force attempts that uh, uh, target servers that have an exposed SSH port uh, listening with you know common usernames and passwords. So if you have any sort of server, whether it's a you know part of an HPC cluster or just a, a standard Unix server, you're nonstop getting hammered by numerous brute force attempts from all over the internet trying to guess usernames and passwords. And if they succeed, that's when they'll you know replace your uh, SSHD binaries to collect usernames and passwords and sort of spread spread the infection from there to gather more credentials. The other thing that we see, though, is we also see increasingly targeted attacks where instead of simply drive-by uh, sort of scans for, for machines to brute force, um, for instance, in the, the Apache.org attack of last year where um, the attackers actually got as far as the Apache build servers, um, compromising the admins and, and, and all the local accounts originally through an XSS, right, through a web vulnerability uh, on their Jira instance, right? They just so happen to have an open, you know, bug tracking system that an attacker posted an uh, an exploit onto that uh, compromised that user's accounts. And of course, with passwords being shared, um, you know, between different accounts, they're able to follow that user into the Apache infrastructure. And so th that's that's one of the big challenges that we see. That you know, even if systems are secure themselves, um, the end users are often the ones being targeted. Okay, so still most of the time we're talking about users actually gaining access into doing some sort of root escalation. So you guys actually have a product, and that's Duo Security, which I recently started using, and, and I've liked it so far. Um, what is it, and how does it prevent these like brute force attacking or compromised passwords? Uh, Duo is a, an implementation of two-factor authentication, where uh, the two factors involved are something you, you know, which is typically using a password, and our second factor, which is something you have, which in our case is a, um, a phone, either a mobile phone, a landline, um, or actually a hardware token that we also support. Um, but th this idea has been around for forever. Um, I think the original you know, DoD Orange book, uh, back from the Rainbow Book days, um, kind of outlined different models of, of authentication um, that would be used uh, for different you know, levels of security uh, for, for government use. And... Um, the idea behind providing, again, a secondary factor authentication is simply that, you know, passwords are easily lost, shared, stolen, um, and uh, they're hard to audit. You know, you, sometimes it's, it's very difficult to tell if, if, if your password has been stolen. Um, and if, you know, if you're using things like SSH keys, for instance, right, those can also be stolen. Those are also just secret numbers that happen to be in a file on, on, on disk. But again, with, with end users being targeted, those can be stolen as well. And so the idea behind Duo is, you know, try to, to try to make two-factor authentication as easy to deploy as possible, as easy to use as possible, and uh, with as little administrative burden as possible, right? Because, you know, who has time to go and, and manage a bunch of, you know, hardware inventory in the form of these tiny little hardware tokens that you have to carry around? Um, and, you know, the, the, our, our background being, I, I used to do actually security for the university, um, managing actually a bunch of Unix uh, machines. Um, um, you know, I know the constraints. I think of uh, you know of, of uh, you know having having any kind of security budget in, in sometimes in those environments, 
And so uh, we've actually made this solution free for up to 10 users um, and with a lot of large sites even having less than 10 admins. Um, you know, it's it's a, an honor and privilege for us to be able to give it away to actually some some very very large sites with quite a lot of compute resources um, to protect. Um, you know, in a way that, that they can actually afford. So that that's really the goal of the so, company. So I wonder if you could explain this to me. So you said you know very large sites, but uh, it's free up to ten users. But you cited ten administrators. So are you talking ten administrators or ten login users or what? What exactly does that mean? Yeah, ten, 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 ten users of the system who who would be using their their phones to, for instance, log in to um, to manage a bunch of uh, you know different uh, different systems. You, you may not, for instance, have um, two factor required for your users submitting jobs. Um, you know, although we'd argue that you probably should, but uh, but certainly for admin access, right, for for, for root accounts and so forth, um, you know, we're, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for folks to be able to roll out. Um, Oh, so, so, so yeah. that's actually pretty cool. So you're talking about a different granularity here that some users could have two-factor and some users not. Did I understand that correctly? Right, yeah. And a lot of our customers are deploying us for uh, administrative or privileged access to uh, Unix servers. It's sort of a, a different uh, model than the traditional enterprise case where you have a lot of users, all your employees, accessing a handful of systems when in some HPC environments you have maybe a handful of admins that are accessing you know, hundreds or thousands of, of actual systems underneath. Right, so, so you can give an example, right? You know, we have, we have a, a, a customer um, who's using the system for free down in Indiana, um, the uh, Indiana uh, High Performance Computing Group down there, who for their various you know, Linux and um, uh, I believe AIX clusters, uh, you know, have have us deployed as part of their their requirement for their their TerraGood grant, and um, you know, again, this has allowed them to to again maintain compliance with these sort of university regulations and so forth, and and those grant terms. Um, in a way, it's just very easy for them to manage because they just don't they don't have that many people, um, you know, logging into the systems for for administrative access. So you mentioned you know using this for administrative users, but that maybe managing thousands of systems. If if I need to distribute just a new configuration for my resource manager to my thousand compute nodes, do I actually have to you know authenticate a thousand times? How would you set this up to have two factor, but somehow still make it easy for the administrator to push things to all of the systems at once using SCP or some other tool? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things we have coming on the pike, uh, specifically as, as for, for that use case that we've we've seen from this environment, um, is a is a way to batch those transactions, um, so that we can actually have, for instance, all of them approved at, at once, right? But, but visible, for instance, within within your smartphone. So one of the ways that we we do authenticate people out of band using their smartphone is with a mobile application called Duo Mobile that's available for free for pretty much every mo every major smartphone platform. And um, we can actually literally push the details of, of the commands being executed in the transaction to the phone to actually approve or deny with, uh, with one touch. Um, and in, in, other, in other scenarios, we're, we're also doing things, for instance, like in, like in financial services, where we might only do that if um, there's some element of the request that is actually anomalous. All right, so, so, so adaptive authentication um, based on maybe where the user is doing it from. Or whether, you know, in, in their case, if it's uh, like a, a new pay or something, we can do that. Um, but for, you know, large-scale compute environments, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at different models um, to do fraud detection and, and so forth to make, make this kind of thing really scalable in that way. So how is this implemented? Is, am I, I'm guessing that this is kind of a Linux PAM kind of service so that it can inject itself during the login or, or pseudo kinds of uh, levels of authentication? Or where, where do you insert this? Yeah, for our, our Unix integrations, we have uh, sort of two models. The, the one is that you, you mentioned with a, a PAM module that can uh, work with any sort of PAM-enabled application, whether it's sudo or su or uh, OpenSSH with uh, uh, password auth. Uh, the second that we use, which is, is very common for Unix integrations, is a, uh, a wrapper called Login Duo, which um, wraps your traditional uh, login shell um, and is executed in uh, OpenSSH, uh, these uh, force command uh, configuration. So we post-authentication, we can actually wrap your shell and make sure you go through a secondary stage of authentication 
which allows us to um, integrate with, uh, you know, PubKey auth for OpenSSH, which, um, you know, using a PAM module is, is not feasible in that, that scenario. Right. Are there other ways as well? Like, what, what's say, um, you know, I'm building a, a specialized application that's not necessarily a root level application, but I have some privileged actions in there. Is there an API that I can use to, you know, call your stuff and say, hey, get me a two factor before I perform this authenticate or before I perform this privileged operation? Yep, absolutely. So we have we have uh, both Unix C APIs that are available. That's actually as part of that Duo Unix package. Uh, a libdo that you can link against and, and simply call to authenticate, you know, just about anything. And then we also have web SDKs that are all open source. So all this all this integration code is, is all open source and hosted at our GitHub at github.com slash duo security. And um, we support PHP, Java, .NET, you know, uh, Ruby, Python. Yeah, we, we are open source guys, and that's our, our background. So, you know, we, we feel that not only uh, giving back to the open source community is a good thing, but also the fact that, you know, you're deploying these uh, PAM modules and, and login duo and uh, web SDKs on sensitive servers. So you really do need the source to be able to audit for security purposes and... Um, you know, we, we, we supply that, you know, fully open in our GitHub to, to the world. Yeah. Well, I mean, we just kind of elaborate on that. I mean, I actually was one of the authors of OpenSSH. If you look at the SSH man page, you'll, you'll find me there. And, um, you know, the, the design of our Unix integration, which includes, again, that, that login program, was really to allow for you to be able to deploy us without re restarting any SSH servers anywhere. And so the, the, that's an interesting thing, I think, about, about our login duo um, integration that is sort of unique is that you can deploy it as a user. You don't even need root-level access to deploy it um, if you tie it to, for instance, your SSH authorized keys. Um, and you can also deploy it in a way that doesn't require, again, any, any changes to any system configuration or, um, or, uh, or any restart of SSHD. So, uh, so for, for, for large production environments that, again, you can't take down or whatever, um, you, know, you can't bounce, um, you know, it's an easy way to introduce it without really messing anything up. So one thing I want to point in here is that so I set up Login Duo on all my um, personal systems and stuff. I had like six different machines, a couple of VMs. They were all Linux-based and one Mac-based machine. It was really easy. I didn't have to set up an actual server because you guys are actually providing a service. Everything's set up on your end. All I have to do is the client-side stuff. So compare, I had always been freaking out about two-factor, and I got scared a little bit and came across this installed it and it was ridiculously easy to set up i was really happy with the way it was done yeah that's something we really uh targeted is is the ease of uh deployment for our two-factor auth you know we, we don't want you to have to deploy a, a, a extra server on premise or on your network especially if you're a small user with you know 10 machines or something like that so being able to just drop something a very lightweight module into each server you're trying to protect and have it all backed by our you know, secure cloud host and service, that's a, a real win from the integration cost of, of adding two-factor auth. Actually, a, f a funny thing is uh, half, sometimes I forget that I even have it there, and I like SCP a file up there, and all of a sudden my phone rings, and I'm like, who the heck's calling me? And I pick it up, and it's like, <laughs> this is Duo security. Someone's trying to log in, approve this, press star. It was like, oh, right. oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, I want that to happen. <laughs> That is one so of the wait, downsides. Hold on. That, that's fascinating right there. So this is not like the traditional RSA token, although I know you said you guys offer tokens as well. But that's mm -hmm. actually pretty darn convenient because uh, I have to admit, I, I was assuming we were talking about typing in a code somewhere. But you're talking about you just perform some action, you get a phone call, and you hit star, and then it goes through. Did I understand that right? Yep. Yep. That's, that's one of the factors. So we, we support phone calls. We support you know passcode sent via SMS. Um, we also support, you know, hardware hardware tokens and soft, soft, software generated, you know, one time passwords that uh, our mobile application produces. But then we also, you know, support this, this smartphone push, which is, um, you know, I think really unique to our system. That you know, if you have a smartphone, um, you can you know, receive a notification and simply hit approve or deny to approve it. Oh, that is tremendously cool. Yeah, That's actually, cool. I had something come up recently where I needed to provide temporary access to a system to uh, some remote providers. I actually generated some of those SMS tokens and in your settings you let me say how long those tokens were good for. So I said you only have 24 hours before these tokens go bad. It was actually kind of a neat way to like give them something that would work and, and, and it all worked. It was pretty nice. 
Oh. Yeah, we've, we've tried to stay sort of uh, authenticator agnostic, you know, supporting whatever authenticators, uh, you know, work best and are most flexible for the users. So, you know, we understand that users have a wide range of requirements, um, whether they have a smartphone, whether they have a dumb phone, whether that phone is online or offline when they happen to be logging in, or even if the user has no phone whatsoever and needs a, a traditional hard token. I, I must say, though, that the, the neatest part is... Uh the fact that you let me type in a message per server that when the phone calls me it does like text to speech on that so like i have, <laughs> i have the dumbest things said to me when my certain servers call me it's pretty funny <laughs> <laughs> hey let me ask a, a completely out of the box kind of question here so i i'm not a security expert. I, I, I sort of understand the, the issues around these things, but it, uh, it strikes me that there's at least some kind of similarity here between uh, authorization of a, a particular individual, right? You're looking to say, yes, this is Joe, and therefore he is allowed to do this particular operation, right? Um, does OpenID come into this at all, or is there ever a meshing between uh, you, you know, the two-factor authentication that you're talking about and a, and a particular say, open ID on a random service? Yeah. It's, Does that make it's any not, sense at all? <laughs> yeah, no, no, sure. No, it, is, it is confusing space for sure. I mean, authentication means a lot of things to a lot of people. And um, particularly, you know, in HPC, you know, things like federated identity are, are certainly hot topics with a number of researchers and different organizations that do need sometimes to access each other's environments. Um, you know, we're, you know, we talk a lot with the Internet 2 folks about uh, what they're doing with in common and um, have seen actually some of the, the challenges of, of how organizations represent their users to each other's systems, right? Um, that's slightly different problem than the one that we, we deal with. Um, you know, we think it's you know, certainly important um, you know, to have uh, a way to sort of fluidly authenticate right, yourself. Just like having passports, right? To be able to cross, cross international borders, you kind of, kind of do want to have a, a system um, online that allows you to um, authenticate as you know, as a representative of your organization to another organization. Um, but what we really do in terms of two-factor is um, it's, it's more like a, an identity, identity verification in, in a way that's out of band. And so um, because we're not ever, you know, um, providing primary authentication, we're not ever making an assertion about who you are and what organization you belong to, we simply tell you that, yeah, this is the same guy that logging in that with this, that has this device, has this phone that, you saw last time, it's more uh, a way to kind of um, again, tie a piece, a tie, a piece of physical hardware to an account where otherwise, you know, you, you don't know where this person's coming from. You know, you don't know, you know, just because they have the password, maybe it's them, maybe it's not. And so okay, it's well, a quick, actually, the, the key word you threw in there that made it make sense for me is you're not doing the primary authentication. So that, that I think that makes it uh, clear. There, there was a very polite way of saying, no, you're wrong, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually from a, not only a philosophical standpoint of, you know, we don't want to get involved in, in, in that hairy, hairy space of, of password management and single sign-on and federated identity, but also from a, a security standpoint where we only want to be that, that secondary verification step. We don't want to ever be in that, that uh, path of your primary authentication. That's, that's not our job. That should be uh, handled independently for security purposes. And it's also, it's, it's kind of like belt and suspenders, right? It's, it's the reason why we believe that our service is, is completely appropriate to offer as a cloud-hosted service, you know, again, uh, that you guys uh, would use remotely, um, because all we ever track are uh, an opaque identifier tied to a device identifier. We have no user, we have no full names, we have no addresses, we have no email addresses, um, we store no personal identifying information at all, which um, again really reduces the scope of, of risk when you when you think about you know uh, tying a, uh, you know some portion of your login to an external service, and so you know um, we're, we're we're really the service that you use to reach out and touch that person that you're 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 uh, seeing a login from, and that's about it. So because of this, though um, the machine you're connecting to needs to have network access. Obviously, if you're protecting only SSH or something like that, if it didn't have working network access, it wouldn't work. But what does happen, uh, say if I'm at a local console and I want to run sudo and I've got the PAM module in place and I've taken the machine off network because I want to make sure that it's not being touched or something like that because I'm concerned about it, what's Duo do right. when I can't see the network? 
Yeah, so we have we have a, a bunch of different different models for that. So we have a, a, a one particular configuration that allows you to define the the, the failure mode um, if the network is down, and um, it can either fail safe, which is to say that you basically duo is disabled and allows the operation, or it can fail secure, which is to say that it, it simply you know um, prevents the operation, um, and and by default it's fail safe. So you know, if if we can't be reached to do the secondary verification, then uh, you know we can be simply disabled out of the path. Um, but we're also working on, on various policy um, configuration as well, where you can actually define that in, on, a, on a more fine-grained basis. You know, we have a, n- a number of customers who only want to uh, use us when um, they see logins from an un- unknown IP address or um, you know one that they, they don't trust. Um, and that's something that again is, is pretty easy easy for us to add, so that it, it limits limits the, uh, the the burden to the user when, when they have to see us. So, so going back a little bit to, in the conversation here, you said you guys are, are all open source. Woohoo! We love open source. Um, and all your stuff is on GitHub and things like that. Do you have much of a developer community surrounding you? Or is your code mostly out there just for transparency and third-party verification, you know, other eyeballs on the code and things like that? Or do you actually get, you know, submissions from other people or have regular developers outside of your organization? I yeah. think it's I think it's a little of both. You know, we, we have had a, a number of uh, uh, external developer contributions, especially to, to Duo Unix, which is our uh, uh, you know integration with 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 Pam and uh, Login Duo. Um, our, our our original goal is to make it very transparent, but you know as we see um, as as new customers come in and customers have different requirements, um, we do see more of a community developing um, for people who want to uh, add to our service. And uh, you know, augment the functionality in ways that you know we might not have thought of ourselves, but they might have particular requirements or particular uh, functionality that they'd like to add. So we, we have been getting a, a number of contributions that are are you know non-trivial from uh, the external community. What we also see is we actually do see a community of folks actually um, open sourcing specific integrations, right? That that our our service can be applied toward. And so, for instance, we've had uh, you know two students uh, uh, submit um, WordPress, Drupal. Um, Code Igniter, uh, you know, at some point probably, you know, we have, uh, there's another third party that's that's uh, working on a media wiki integration. Um, and all these are, are just simply drop-in modules for those those different applications to add, again, two-factor auth to those logins. Because pretty much anywhere there's a login protect, you can add us. Um, but uh, if someone has already done the work to do it, then it's, it's just easy to just drop, drop in and, and be up and running with it. Yeah, and in particular with our web integrations where we have a number of... Uh Sort of native uh, integrations in our SDK for each particular language, you know, anywhere from Cold Fusion to Classic ASP to Node.js, Python, PHP, .NET, you know, across the board. Um, but you know, as you know, there's a, a thousand and one different web frameworks out there. So uh, we've had a lot of contributions coming from these these custom web frameworks where people take our existing, you know, PHP SDK and then they integrate it into the Drupal framework, and then uh, we release that to the community. So actually, let me interject here. I, in my personal non-professional life here, I, I do a bit of work with Drupal uh, kinds of things. How far along is that module? Is that stable, usable by the general population? Yep, it's uh, it was posted, you know, proudly posted to the Drupal blog uh, some time ago, and there's a, there's a bunch of folks using it. Oh, I need to go investigate that when we're done here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one so question. I had a question for you guys. So, what what are the main kind of concerns that you guys have? Because um, we, we we've seen actually a number of breaches um, at, at various uh, sites um, across campuses, but also from some different you know research groups um, that have been pretty staggering. Um, you know, with attackers that are pretty really pretty clueful. I mean, they in some cases no no internals of AFS and Kerberos, and you know. They, or, I mean, the degree of sophistication of some, some attackers these days, particularly trying to get access to, to large compute resources to, you know, mine bitcoins or <laughs> run, run, again, large password cracking uh, <laughs> jobs, right? That's sort of a perennial favorite. And we see this stuff all the time. Um, and um, I always curious, sort of, you know, what, what, what you guys see as the main concerns that, you know, that the community has. Well, uh, Jeff, I'll start with this one, considering I'm an admin of a site with public users. Um, so <laughs> my point of view has almost been being around this, not, not even for that long, is that it's not a matter of if, it's more of a matter of when. 
And when that happens, it's still a major, major task of going through and cleaning stuff up. So, of course, we want to prevent it from happening as many times as possible or, you know, just other things. You know, we have a thousand hosts and you've got to quickly somehow verify that you've got a, a new load to put on all of them that's secure, but you don't know what data they've touched and you've got a 140 terabyte scratch file system. How do you trust any of that data anymore? Because who knows what's been placed where? Um, it's a it's a it's a real pain. Uh, so you know, preventing it if possible, and then minimizing it when it happens. Yeah. So I, I'll chime in from the user side because I'm I'm just a poor schlep engineer developer type over here at, at Cisco, right? So I'm not involved in any of the IT administration or anything. We're, we're fortunate over here at Cisco that we have actually pretty darn good IT support. I mean, they when they implement a new service and roll it out to all sixty plus thousand employees, that it generally tends to work pretty well. Our VPN, for example, um, I do have a two factor out there. I have a little RSA token, which hopefully that's secure, but nobody really knows <laughs> right now. Um, but, you know, when I connect, it, it works. It just works. I pull it out. I type in one number and it, it goes through. And I look at that in comparison to some of my peers who are in academia or other research organizations or even other non-IT based, you know, uh, industry organizations. And it takes 10 minutes to log in on their VPN. I mean, that's that's insane. Um, the, the real frustration that I can see from the user side is that it's got to just work and be just easy. Kind of like what I was saying at the beginning of the podcast here, that you want it to be as transparent as possible. Yeah, you got to, you know, in the user's mind, it's got to be, yes, I got to do this extra step for security. There's a good reason that I'm doing this, but then it should just work from there and not be a, oh, God, I got to sign on to my VPN and then type in six more passwords and da 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 you know. So if it works and it works well, I think, you know, one minor speed bump before getting to your email or whatever task it is you're trying to do is much more palatable uh, to the end user. I've seen users with good security implementations who are like, oh, well, yeah, I just I pull out my RSA token and I go and, uh, you know, that's it. And others uh, who, uh, you know, like I said, I, I, that's that's a no joke citation of 10 minutes to log on to a VPN. And, that, and that's just painful. It yeah. really discourages you from wanting to get on the VPN. Yeah, so we, that's my big thing. It's got to work and it's got to work well. We see that all the time. You know, security is always a balance of protection versus usability. And it's a it's a very delicate trade off. If you try to roll out uh, security mechanisms that are just so abhorrent that your user population rejects them or it's so unusable that it drives your costs up prohibitively high, it's just not going to work. So you need something that, that adds that extra security but does it, like as you said, in a, a transparent way to the user where it doesn't cause a, a extra speed bump for them. So you know, adding the speed bump for, or the, the gates for attackers but not, not adding the gates for your legitimate users. So let me ask you guys a question. You're, you're a cloud-based service here. So let me ask you some of the typical cloud risk factors here. I mean, how many, how many data centers do you guys have? How many you know, different feeds and pops do you have on the internet? What happens when you go down? You know, yeah. I'm a CTO asking, uh, asking you for implementation for my company. Yeah. So one of the things that we've, you know, having built a business prior with our, at Arbor Networks, where we, we literally saved the internet from from DDoS, because um, back in 2000 when we started the company, um, that company, um, there were 14 year old kids literally in Canada that were taking out eBay, Amazon, eTrade, CNN, Yahoo, just for, I guess, for the lulls, right, as people say today. Um, and now all that's mostly gone away now because of the plumbing, the the, the traffic monitoring and management systems that we basically deployed across pretty much every major backbone provider. Um, we've had a lot of experience with, with you know, things like DDoS and uh, large-scale network attack you know, for, for a better part of a decade. And um, you know, with the cloud, it's, it's, it's been interesting. Um, we, we've actually um, been multi-cloud for some time. And the idea behind that is really that, um, and, and also that you know, in terms of our points of presence, I mean, we, we maintain shadow deployments across multiple regions um, with a lot of infrastructure that we can actually repurpose and reprovision 
um, literally in an automated fashion, right? Sw swapping out. Um, if, if you take a look, if you, anyone takes a look at the, the details of our deployment, can you kind of reverse engineer how we're how we're doing things? You'll see that, for instance, all the customer records um, for where our API hosts, our endpoints are, and so forth are all behind customer specific DNS uh, records and so forth that allow us to again um, move things around appropriately. And, and that really is uh, the magic, I think, of, of uh, modern cloud computing today, uh, which is that it is elastic. We can spin things up, spin things down, move them around as needed um, in a way that, you know, to date has allowed us to preserve uh, over four and a half nines uptime. Um, is all, you know, we have, we pay for other people to, to measure us, but that's, that's, um, that's sort of where we are right now with, with our reliab site reliability. And, um, and also do that for other reasons that are not necessarily uh, security and availability related, but have to do with issues of jurisdiction and so forth. I mean, there, there are lots of organizations who, you know, they, they want to know that their, 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 their cloud providers um, are in, a, you know, in their data is in a jurisdiction that, you know, that is applicable to them. And so we do have ability to go and deploy because of um, our, our multi-pronged kind of deployment approach. Um, into you know private cloud hosting you know scenarios on multi-tenant public clouds, um, but also for very large customers deploy on site on premise. And so you know that that's you know the the, the I know it's a little bit hand wavy, but the, the honest answer there is that you know we're able to do just about anything the customer wants us to do in terms of deployment. But what we find is that most folks actually are are just fine with us us being um, you know, using our multi, our default multi-tenant cloud service. Um, because of the, the flexibility it gives us and them to scale up, scale down, and also defend them against attack. So one thing I noticed, you've, you know, you've got these WordPress plugins and you've got the, the, the PAM module and you've got the Duo Unix, which actually has a neat way to integrate with protecting SSH keys, which I thought was pretty neat. But uh, um, I noticed you didn't have a, a Windows client. Uh, it's, can you enlighten us about that? <laughs> Yeah, you know the, the honest truth is we're you know we're uh, we're we're a little bit Unix bigots. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just honest. I'm just being honest with you. Um, you know we 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 do have um, we do have Windows integrations. Um, we just don't like to do them, and we we, we are coming out with um, you know uh, again native you know uh, integrations for things like RDP you know, terminal services. We already have. Um, you know, again, uh, things like form form authentication for for things you can put behind, um, you know, what the, what's this, the sequel to UAG um, TMG or, and so forth. Um, Sorry, we're, we're, you got to understand, Brock and I are, are Unix bigots too. We don't know what this <laughs> alphabet soup is that you're throwing around. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> It is a pretty pretty uh, soupy alphabet, um, but there's you know if you look back at the the Windows authentication history with 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 Gina and OWA and TMG and well, well yeah but, but it's really the ISA policy server it became the UAG became the the TMG the threat management gateway and you know the the whole ecosystem of of, of what. Microsoft networking architecture looks like right for security and so forth is is a uh, is a realm in which we have to play and so we we do I mean we we, we have we have those things um, and we we are working again to kind of go lower level to bake into things even like desktop login right that some people have asked for um, but you know out of the gate we prefer to to you know because what we see also is that by and large most of the big uh, Big computing environments that we see that are not desktop, right? But they're all servers. Are are, are Unix? Um, you know, we, we we do still see you know, um, you know, uh, a handful of Windows servers um, being deployed for things like Exchange and email and all that, all the rest of that that whole corporate stack, IT stack. But when it comes to you know high performance computing and other things, um, you know, large scale computing environments, um, I mean, I don't know what you guys see out there either. If if you've seen a lot of that. And we, we we did have other, for instance, um, you know, friends, you know, previous customers at Arbor and so forth, uh, at companies like Terramark that have run some of the world's largest VMware vCloud instances, but those have also supported a lot of Unix instances, right? Um, you know, so I, you know, I'm not going to slag too much on Microsoft and Windows stuff, but uh, the honest truth is, it's, it's um, and particularly for for your podcast listeners, I think is hopefully they'll appreciate that you know we're 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 big. Big big Unix guys, whether it's Linux, John has done a lot of Linux kernel stuff. I did a bunch of NFSv4 stuff for Linux and BSD, 
I was also OpenBSD developer. Um, and uh, I think we all cut our teeth on things like Sonos back in the day. And um, yeah, our, 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 I've, I've, been, I've watched with, fascinated, with fascination as you know, pretty much all the commercial unices have died out over the past decade um, and <laughs> replaced by, by, by Linux. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we're doing what we can to kind of keep the dream alive. <laughs> I'm sure that, uh, you know, that Unix, Unix is still the, the, the most secure and, you know, you know, I mean, it's certainly the most flexible environment for computing today. So I, I want to touch on something else. Uh, the university uses a lot of Kerberos type systems where, you know, you get a ticket that lives somewhere um, that then gives you authentication access. Or you also mentioned TerraGrid. TerraGrid uses a lot of grid security infrastructure, GSI, um, yeah. where it's just another ticket-based system. It, it seems like if you had a compromised system, you could then just take somebody's ticket and then do something. It, does Duo do anything for that, or is that something that is just, that's a hole in that kind of system? No, absolutely. That's that's exactly the, I think, the the, the point of, of us being able to do, transa- like, uh, authenticate transactions versus users, Um you know, in a given application, uh, because tickets again are, are effectively shared secrets, right? That that if they're stolen, right, they they can be be reused um, sometimes, sometimes not. Um, but certainly, that the the end user passwords that are used to, to you know acquire those tickets can be compromised. And so, you know, for, for certain sites, for instance, you can imagine that there might be some some kind of batch batch keying system and stuff that um, you know upon job submission. Would be able to validate that the that the user who submitted that actually was was, was them, and we could, you know, you could use all the rest of the, the native. I don't I don't know what's what's hot these days in this world, whether right? it's Globus or whatever. All this all this all this, all that gobbledygook, um, but uh, um, on the back end of that, you know, the application, we can actually again um, be added to authenticate individual transactions if they look like they're weird or if they're high risk. Right, so you can imagine that, you know, we might be deployed only for certain accounts or only for certain kinds of, for jobs, um, and or only for certain infrastructure that that's really mission critical, and um, and we're we're fine with it. That's that's you know that's really our goal is to make sure that, you know, where, where two factor can be useful and and, and is needed that um, it can be deployed appropriately. And we don't necessarily want to make those decisions for the customer. I mean, the customer knows best. The customer is always right. They know their threat profile. They know their applications. And they know where the sensitive transactions lie. Right. But it's interesting. I, mean, I did a bunch of work on uh, – I, I did all the original uh, integration of AFS and Kerberos uh, into SSH, all the ticket grant, ticket passing stuff um, and so forth. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer. I'm a big believer in, you know, trusted third-party Needham shorter based you know, <laughs> key exchange protocols. But at the same time, they don't solve every problem, and and you know the the, the threat has really migrated towards something that's so, so much more mundane, right? You can have all that awesome infrastructure, and still some someone someone somewhere opens the wrong email. So where are you guys going uh, in the future? Do you have any uh, features that you can talk about publicly that are coming down the pike? You mentioned one earlier already. Um, but given that at least some of this stuff is developed in the open or maybe you develop internally and then push to the open, uh, what are some things that your users and customers can expect in the future? Well, you know, one of the things that we're doing, because, you know, there is a lot of hype around, you know, mobile security and what's happening there. And, and then which kind of begs the question, you know, can you really trust your phone as a, uh, as an authenticator, right, for, for, for access? And, um, you know, Jono here has done, you know, quite a lot in that area. Um, most of the major breaks in Android over the last year, including the, the pretty, you know, catastrophic break of the Google Android Marketplace that uh, took Google quite some time to just to, to fix up, um, were part of some of the research that we've done in this in this area where, um, you know, the, the, the computers that are now in our pockets, you know, these, these smartphones, um, you know they're 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 better networked and uh, in some cases more powerful than than our, our our actual computers were just just five years ago, and um, and so again there there is there is some appreciable threat there that um, you know we also need to to, to help solve, and um, some of the things we have coming down the pike uh, are targeting exactly that to make sure that you know your your mobile device is secure and um, is clear clean and free of any threats so that you can actually use it in a, in a secondary way for, for authentication. Um, 
But beyond that, you know, um, a lot has to do with our our specific integrations. We've got we built what we believe is the best platform in the industry for for doing this kind of thing, and um, uh, we just hope to find it uh, ap- applied to, to more and more environments. Um, because again, there, there are plenty of places where you log in to, to access something sensitive or you know mission critical. Um, that if again, if, if we had a chance to protect, um, it would it would really improve a site security. So what's uh, some of the like websites and places to get information about Duo? Uh, well, our our own website, uh, www.duosecurity.com, um, is uh, is you know, where you can actually sign up for our, our our service again for free for up to ten users and without a, without even a credit card. It's just, you know you just sign up and you can be up and running and using it in literally five minutes. Um, we also have a blog where we talk about security issues of the day. Um, and actually, one of the one of the posts that we, we want to do at some point is we'll be looking at some of the uh, the security issues um, in this environment in you know research computing and um, you know, high performance computing because there there have been some some fairly high profile breaks over the last you know few years um, that you know, again kind of went by quietly but if you look at them I mean are fairly serious because one of the interesting things about you know this domain is you've got lots of users from lots of different places sometimes with sometimes you know really interesting you know, access a lot of really interesting systems and data. And um, if you're able to compromise them, one of the reasons people go and do things like install, you know, backdoor to SSH demons that mail passwords out, right, <laughs> once, they've, once they've compromised, uh, you know, the login server for, for one of these clusters, um, is because those users go lots of places and, and sometimes, you know, use the same passwords or, or credentials, again, to get, to get, get, it, get elsewhere. Um, and if you kind of map out, you know, you map out the, the incidents that have happened. Um, and in other communities, right, where there's so-called ISACs or these incident sharing um, sort of uh, um, uh, communities that, that, you know, compare notes on, on who's been breached and how and, and why and from, from where, you'll find that there's just these huge attack trees that, that follow from, from one site being attacked to many other sites being attacked. And, again, oftentimes going back to the users. Um, and, uh, and and that's that's actually a topic that we, we we do intend to cover because it's it's one of the one, one of those things that is very very tangible um, and that sometimes um, you can find out details about whereas you know a bank being breached um, everyone ends up being very hush hush about so we'll, we'll start to you know cover some more of those kind of things and, and you also find other folks you know um, tweeting and blogging about us if you look for DuoSec on Twitter um, you can follow us there and uh, you'll also probably find lots of folks. Um, you know, uh, tweeting and blogging about uh, their experiences with us. And as Doug mentioned, it's really easy to get uh, started once you sign up on our site. And I, I think our our record time that we've clocked so far is from sign up to a working dual Unix integration in production was six minutes. So you know, if anyone out there thinks they're a, a <laughs> better better Unix guy, we we invite you to break that record. Excellent. <laughs> Okay, guys. Well, well, thanks a lot. We're going to wrap this up, and uh, I'll have the show up soon. And thanks again for your time. Yeah, thanks for your time, guys. All right. Thank you guys so much. We appreciate it.